All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So thank you all for coming to the second installment of the series Emerging Voices in Reese. I know the semester has just began and I'm sure everyone is very busy and never not on Zoom. So your presence is much appreciated. Um, we started organizing the Emerging Voices series last year to give up and coming scholars a platform to share their work as they both navigate and sort of reshape the field slash fields. And we have a fantastic lineup of speakers for this semester. So please check out the website, which Christina just shared in the chat to see uh, what we have scheduled. I am happy to introduce our first speaker for this semester, Anya Eisman. Anya is a postdoctoral fellow in the Michigan Society of Fellows and assistant professor in the Slavic department. She is writing a book called From Tolstoy to Pussy Riot, Anarchist Currents in Russian Culture. Based on archival research and oral histories with artists, writers, and activists, it finds missing links between the 19th century anarchist movements, Soviet underground cultures, and contemporary arts and political organizations. Anya has also written about Soviet children's literature and the avant-garde and has translated contemporary Russian plays for theaters and scholarly publications. Her writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The Russian Review, and other venues. So please join me in welcoming Anya Eisman. Thank you so much. I'm totally thrilled to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And I will uh, go ahead and get started. So in uh, this talk, I will just present on a little bit of the larger material from my book project. And in this book project, this is the title of it, I set myself a, what I hope is a very basic task of tracing connections between um, seemingly disparate eruptions of anarchist activity uh, and during times of suppression, their continued work underground in cultural production and reception. To keep the hope of anarchist self-governance alive, anarchists rethought and reformulated theories of social change in memoirs, poems, adventure stories, parables, legends, and political essays. And so my book shows that through the creation and circulation of texts, as well as uh, visual and other cultural materials, Russian anarchists from the late 1800s and until today aim to develop political practices to articulate theories of how social transformation can happen in a post-revolutionary world and to cultivate local anti-authoritarian ways of life in an unfree context. I further ask why it is that anarchism in these textual guises appeal to such different late and post-Soviet Russian inheritors, dissident writers and uh, hippie dropouts, academic historians and punks, high school students and war veterans, performance art collectives and fascist fighting gangs. Why do all of these different people continue to take an interest in historical anarchism? And I conclude that literature and its reception, literature and the arts and their reception have been part of a political anarchist movement. Far from merely affording a chance at cultural survival, sort of keeping the, uh, the lights on, so to speak, anarchist literature and uh, arts uh, worked out theories of social change that writers tried to put into practice in cultural organizations, um, eventually hoping they will merge with also political action. So I will bring you up to speed very briefly and all too sketchily on what happens up until up to 1921 in in uh, in anarchism in Russian anarchism. So as one scholar observed, anarchism was the principal ideology of global radicalism between the collapse of the first international in the 1870s and the consolidation of the communist international or common turn in the 1920s. In the late 19th century, then, there were broad membership organizations, anarchist organizations in France, in Italy, in Britain, in Argentina, in Brazil, uh, and elsewhere. 
and they were actively debating the ideas of Russian anarchists. Um, uh, Mikhail Bakunin, Pyotr Krapotkin, as well as the Christian anarchist Leo Tolstoy. In Russia proper, however, anarchist organizations emerged with the first Russian Revolution of 1905, and they established a support base among the poorest workers and peasants. Anarchists numbered around 10,000 at that time and grew despite Tsarist repression, reprisals against radicals. Many anarchist groups participated in the February and October revolutions of 1917, and anarchist battalions provided vital support to the Red Army in the struggle against monarchist forces, the whites, um, in the Civil War uh, from 1917 to 1921, and in fact also in the First World War. But already in, during the Civil War, they became the Bolsheviks' uh, most vocal detractors, insisting that quote, Soviets or councils without the Communist Party, without communists, um, are the better uh, form of, a sort of better form of governance, that is to say self-governance. They were demanding essentially direct democratic control rather than party centralism. And though we tend to think of anarchists as hooligans or highway robbers, sort of forest bandits, um, in this tumultuous revolutionary era, there were, in fact, um, anarchist, large anarchist organizations, factories, unions, shops, printing presses, uh, communes, militias, and indeed entire neighborhoods and cities and regions in the provinces that were anarchist. And so starting in 1918, the Bolshevik authorities moved to bring autonomous workers, Soviets and unions under the control of the party and they shut down anarchist organizations and jailed or executed anarchist detractors who uh, along with the, uh, sorry, these are some anarchist journals as well. Can take a letter, later look at that. Um, so they jailed anarchists alongside their other erstwhile detractors, the um, socialist revolutionaries or SRs. Um, and all of these sort of oppositional forces now fought back with bombs and guns against the Bolsheviks. So historians often point to the last, uh, the first months of 1921 as the end of the anarchist movement. Um, the philosopher Peter Kropotkin, elderly and ailing, impoverished in the provinces, passes away in February of 1921, actually a hundred years ago, almost to the day. Um, and his funeral is the last mass anarchist demonstration permitted by Lenin's government. And then in March of 1921, in a brutal mass execution, the Soviet government suppresses an anarchist uprising led by the sailors of the Kronstadt naval base near Petrograd. And so at home and abroad, anarchists watch with horror as the history of their movement is rewritten. Lenin and Trotsky cast anarchism a movement of penurious workers, the lumpen proletariat, as they call it, of peasants, many of them minorities. They cast it as variously uh, elitist or um, illiterate, uh, anti-Semitic, or all too foreign. And so reconvening in exile abroad, anarchists attempted to rally international support for uh, those left in Russia they turned to memoir writing to correct the historical record and to raise some much needed funds. From France, the anarchist Peter um, Arshinov and Nestor Machno uh, wrote memoirs about the largest anarchist society of the revolutionary era, the free territory in Ukraine. And they recorded in mind numbing detail how, between, how anarchists helped the Bolsheviks in strategic collaboration against common enemies, the German in World War I and the monarchists in the Russian Civil War. And that minute accounting meant to emphasize uh, the anarchists tactical sophistication and to rebuke the Bolsheviks for their betrayal. In the United States, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, US anarchists with Russian roots, wrote tell-all memoirs about what they saw in the Soviet Union in 1920, the imprisonment of anarchists and the establishment of a vast Soviet prison system. They were some of the first to criticize Western apologists of Soviet state terror, especially on the left. 
And so the circulation of these kinds of memoirs enabled the financial and ideological survival of the embattled anarchist movement. In the case of the Mahno memoirs, um, Mahnovist memoirs, money from those sales was donated to the anarchist uh, Black Cross to support anarchists in the Soviet prisons. And likewise, the Berkman and, Gold and Goldman memoirs, um, uh, uh, they even financed several um, rather spectacular anarchist escapes from Siberian camps to prison uh, to Europe or the um, uh, United States via Japan. So a key node in this network of anarchist organizations abroad and in Russia was the legendary revolutionist Vera Figner. In the 1880s, she had been a leader in the People's Will, the group that assassinated Tsar Alexander II in 1881. In the early years of the Soviet Union, the Communist Party went to great efforts to recruit her and other luminaries of the revolutionary movement in order to legitimize its power and bring oppositional elements to heel. However, in response to uh, po attacks on political dissent, Figner gravitated toward anarchist enclaves, as did other veterans of the people's will. And much of Figner's activity after the 1917 revolves around memoirs, um, uh, on writing, editing, and soliciting them. On a local, local level, the first volumes of her memoirs practically rescue a small anarchist cooperative press. Nationally, her memoirs become bestsellers, inaugurating a veritable memoir boom. And in my opinion, memoirs like her retain the idea of voluntary communes in the public view, even as collectivization, uplatnenie, and other Soviet policies reduce grassroots communitarianism. So Figner's memoirs and many others describe the daily functioning of a voluntary commune in painstaking detail, and they glorify it. Many of the revolutionary memoirs I read could be characterized by the tension that Katerina Clark described in the Soviet socialist a realist novel between party vanguardists and sort of more spontaneous or elemental characters. But while the socialist realist novel resolves this tension, according to Clark, when the vanguardist uh, uh, comes to embody the um, spontaneous will of the people, the stichinist, in the memoirs, the tension is decidedly uh, is de decided favorably in the other direction. Revolutionary spontaneity is romanticized and glorified in both the revolutionary romantic uh, hero and the revolutionary direct actionist commune that the hero uh, that the hero joins. I find this even in the memoirs of people who came to be known as Soviet anarchists. Although they spend a few passages retroactively um, interpreting their anarchist activities in the 1905 and the 17 revolutions in accordance with Marxist-Leninism, the majority of their work is spent romanticizing and reminiscing about the anarchist life. And so they oscillate between a romantic revolution, a romantic hero and a sort of free anarchist commune, whether underground or in prison. And I find that that's the constitutive um, tension, the dichotomy, right, that structures the memoirs. So Figner and other People's Will revolutionaries use their celebrity to shield a unique organization called the Society of Former Political uh, Prisoners and Exiles. From its inauguration in 1921 and until it was shut down in 1935, it was the only broad tent uh, institution in the Soviet Union serving old revolutionaries who belonged to various non-Bolshevik political organizations and never joined the Communist Party. The society provided revolutionaries across the country with pensions and it paid them to write memoirs. So the society was in large part responsible for the memoir boom of the early 20s. Its journal alone published a thousand memoirs by more almost 600 authors, and the press um, also produced dozens of standalone books each year. In addition to promoting the romance of revolutionary life, and as I've suggested, seeding among Soviet readers concrete and detailed discussions of how communes function in the political underground and in prison, the society itself modeled such a voluntary communitarian enterprise. So instances of collaborative horizontalist collective writing abounded. The manuscripts were submitted by individuals and developed collectively by a cross-party review board. Memoirists exchanged letters to encourage each other to write. 
um, or consult with each other on the details of events, and they quoted sections of each other's memoirs in their own, so that texts became intertext. Uh, intertexts. Now, the memoir uh, bust of the mid 1930s and the purges that imprisoned or executed non Bolshevik revolutionaries suppress those memorialization processes that were happening with great speed in the 20s. So, 1938 has often been seen as the sort of second death of Russian anarchism. Starting in the 1950s, however, historians began to uh, began collecting and archiving anarchist testimonies. In the late Soviet period, the fiery revolutionary series uh, at Politizdat gave cover for research on Kropotkin, Bakunin, Figner, and other uh, figures, um, and with it came the eventual return of anarchist memoirs, um, of reading circles and uh, and groups. And by the late 1980s, avowedly anarchist political organizations where rom romantic revolutionism combined with communitarian practices to various degrees of tension between the two. So back to the 1920s at the opposite end of the anarchist spectrum, a mystical anarchist literature was evolving under the auspices of a very different celebrity revolutionary whose fame, much like Figner's fame, uh, in the other case, protected the group's work. And this was the anarchist uh, philosopher Apollon Karelin. Like Vera Figner, Karelin had been a member of the People's Will. And like, Leo, uh, and like Lev Tolstoy, he became a public defender of religious sectarians suffering czarist persecution. In the tumultuous years after the 1905 revolution, he co-founded the anarchist Black Cross and wrote important works on political economy. In the 1917 revolution, along with other anarchists, he organized the Moscow Federation of Anarchist Groups, which included, um, in addition to uh, hundreds of armed anarchists who conducted expropriations and takeovers of Moscow mansions, also many artists and writers. The Federation established communal quarters, uh, clubs, and presses, and the most famous of these was the House of Anarchy, in Moscow, where uh, artists such as Kazimir Malevich and Alexander Rochenka wrote manifestos of anarcho-futurist art, while a few offices over, anarchists plotted to take over more buildings. So after the civil war ended in 1921, Karilin became a member of the Soviet government, participating in the All-Russian Central Executive Committee of the Soviet Union in order to publicly oppose the, the death penalty, or so he explained it. So Karelin, like Figner, was using the whole array of tactics available to revolutionaries at one time or another. And like her, he sought to unify anarchist and non-anarchist groups into these ecumenical broad tent organizations. Now, uh, aside from all of his big um, energetic political activity, Karelin also co-founded a mystical uh, anarchist movement, uh, the Order of the Russian Templar Knights. Um, and founded in 1919, uh, this was meant to be a broadly popular movement, unlike other esoteric organizations, um, uh, uh, so con contemporaries of um, the Russian Templars, like the Rosicrucians or um, Theosophists, uh, etc. So mystical readings at Karelian's apartment were uh, attended by the literary lights of 1920s uh, Moscow, as well as famous theater and film actors, and um, also factory workers and peasant sectarians. And offshoots grew in dozens of cities and towns. In the early 1920s, hundreds of Russian knights established schools and libraries all over Russia, teaching and studying and generally participating in cultural work that looked quite similar to Communist Party initiatives. However, the Russian knights also offered spiritual education. Like the historic Templar Knights who emerged after the ravages of Inquisition, the Russian Knights sought to restore harmony after the bloody Russian Civil War, or that's how they sort of explained it. And like them, uh, they saw themselves as defenders of religious tolerance. Indeed, the Russian Knights' uh, cosmology depicted the union of religions uh, and a history that rendered national borders and governments meaningless. According to their cosmology, they were spiritual descendants of the inhabitants of Atlantis, 
who after making it to Egypt, took part in Western history as participants in the events of the New Testament and the Crusades and in civilization struggles leading up to the present day. And Templar initiation rituals meant to cultivate that feeling of being this that feeling of being part of a broad humanist project that transcended the current age of state building and went all the way back to all of antiquity's important freedom movements and all of its important historical events, as well as many uh, um, apocryphal events. A progression of stages from novice to adept consisted mostly of required lecture cycles. Um, but few reach the final tenth stage of initiation, of sort of nightly initiation. But the secret rites were quite simple. Um, they involved presenting objects such as flowers and memorizing or retelling and retelling Templar legends. Now, for these legends, Karidin composed hundreds of um, stories and commentaries, and the ritual and lore. Um, that ritual and lore meant to prepare the knight for a life of service in the name of spiritual freedom. Now more than ever, Karelin wrote, our obligation is, protect, is to protect the spiritual development of the individual, Lichnist, everywhere and from any threats whatsoever. So until the time is ripe for another revolution, he wrote, the defense of spiritual freedom is a priority. It alone retains revolutionary consciousness. So here, sort of unlike Marxists, the mystical anarchists uh, believe that consciousness could transform being. Now, whereas for Figner in the memoirs, the revolutionary movement was a history of heroic feats and spontaneous communitarian resistance, for the mystical anarchists, the historic revolution was extremely ambiguous. Karelin, who wrote a dozen Socratic dialogue type plays, presented in one of them a story of a false revolution rejected by spiritual authority. And that play, called Svetnis um, Dieshni, Unearthly Light, reinterprets the events that lead to Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus figures as the mysterious liberator who inspires followers to rebel against the Romans. Now, the followers of the liberator, uh, and I hope you can see this uh, sort of motif now. Um, are a multi-faith and multi-ethnic coalition of the oppressed, uh, the Essenes, the Galileans, and the Egyptians, according to Karelian. Um, by the time this coalition is united, the liberator realizes that, the, that it merely wishes to install him in Pontius Pilate's place as the new king. So he decides to subvert the false revolution by sacrificing his life at the cross. And with this narrative, Karelian aim to warn fellow mystical anarchists that false revolutions and rulers are worse than no revolution at all. By dying, his liberator saves the idea of revolution from corruption and makes possible the continued development of an anti-authoritarian movement, a movement without kings. On the other hand, of course, the liberator abandons his followers in a moment of great anguish and uncertainty. And Karelin's story also means to prepare the knights for that. So Karelin and the Russian Templar Knights wrote a lot of lyric poetry in the style of chivalric romance. Their poems are rife with symbols from their Templar cosmology, like the blue eight-pointed star or red rose, etc. And they sort of swear loyalty to a mystical order and declare the intention of undertaking a quest. So that's all quite similar to um, the um, chivalric romances that they were reading. But whereas medieval knights had some information about where they were going and whom they were serving, the Templar knights in their poetry thematize how little they understand their task uh, of serving the freedom of the spirit. What does that mean? The knights in the Templar poems often stand before an open road, not knowing where to go or traveling alone with no destination or purpose. So the tension motivating these texts appears to be between the obligation of service uh, handed down from one's illustrious ancestry and the fundamental mystery of the presence. The Templar Knights, guardians of freedom in all its forms, felt suspended between the historic community they were a part of and the lonely, ambiguous quest that they were forced to undertake in the present. So when the Soviet government began systematically persecuting religious groups in the mid 1920s, the order went underground, calling itself by different names and operating in greater secrecy. 
Though the movement all but ceased to exist in 1930, some of the Knights continued to preach their cause to students in the labor camps. Inheritors of mystical anarchist teachings who survived the camps became in the late Soviet era mathematicians, philosophers, historians, and science fiction writers. And they became interested in their works in describing spontaneity in all its forms by con connecting the political philosophy of spontaneity, that is anarchism, to its equivalent in scientific and pseudoscientific epistemologies. Like the mystics, the peasant Tolstoyans, or communards, as they called themselves, were a broad tent organization, open to anyone and part of the political process rather than in retreat to it from it. So the Tolstoyan movement had first coalesced around Tolstoy's teachings in the late 1880s and 1890s in a movement that spanned several continents and included pacifists and vegetarians who started communes and free schools. But between 1905 and 1917, many Russian Tolstoyans moved away from what they saw as Tolstoy's individualism, his preoccupation with work on the self. To live out their interpretation of his teachings, they, intellectuals as well as workers, peasants, and religious sectarians and radicals um, of various political parties, began establishing farming communes. In the 1920s, at least in the 1920s, at least 90, 90 communes operated across the USSR. So the communards unequivocally supported the Russian Revolution. All of them, to quote one Tolstoyan, uh, thought that their life and labor serves to advance the goal uh, serve to advance the goal of the Russian Revolution. That is the construction of a worldwide society, brotherly and without government free from violence and exploitation. And so land cultivation constituted their theory of social change. They believed it would bring, it brings people together in voluntary association that obviates the need for central government. In the early 1920s, many of the Tolstoyan communes prospered. They perfected farming and gardening techniques. They taught village schools and they wrote prolifically. And the underlying tension in the entire corpus of communard poems and memoirs um, and diaries that I've come across was between that um, uh, sort of task of communal land cultivation and solitary diary keeping practice that was also very important for them. The recollections, their recollections of commune life discussed in detail, uh, uh, the details of various land cultivation techniques. Their songs and poems marveled at the beauty of uh, ordinary na natural phenomena, grass and bees and streams. But the communards also quoted Tolstoy from memory, memory and reflected on his teachings. And some of them even adopted the estrangement technique that he used in his social criticism, casting themselves as Tolstoyan narrators of their own lives. Now, to the consternation of the, their peasant neighbors, the Tolstoyans replaced church holidays with their own celebrations, featuring songs, plays, poems, and stories that they wrote. And to the consternation of the Communist Party, which by the mid-1920s began trying in earnest to establish collectivized farms in those regions, um, the Tolstoyans insisted on autonomous decision-making. So throughout the 1920s and 30s, they faced very varying degrees of pressure from local party officials to enter into official structures, to hire school teachers with party affiliation, for example, or to merge with a nearby kolkhoz. And the communards practiced nonviolent resistance in response. For example, when local police locked their building, uh, their school building, the communards instituted traveling schools, a practice that proved useful when most of them were arrested and sent to the camps. So communards without a commune, they called themselves, and they substituted uh, in their gulag era uh, writings, the shared uh, literary culture for the land that they lost. So we find in their gulag era diaries and poems, detailed reminiscences of farming successes and copious quotations from each other's poems and songs dedicated to each, other's, to each other, as well as re-readings of Krapotkin and Tolstoy. So while the memoirs portrayed their revolutionary exploits and the mystical anarchists described their syncretic lore, the Tolstoyan uh, agrarian anarchists, as they're sometimes called, 
came together are in, around the contemplation of Tolstoy's teachings on the one hand and farming and nature on the other. Like the political anarchists and the mystical anarchists, the communards took a long view of their defeat. Having lost their communes, they contemplated land. And then later they were able to obtain permission to work on the land while in prison. And then once they're freed, we also see them sort of coming back to the land. So as far as I've been able to tell, the communards who survived the Gulag were entirely disconnected from their ideological siblings, uh, their, the Tolstoyan anarchists who escaped abroad or sort of um, gathered abroad. And yet abroad in Europe and in Canada and the United States is precisely where the Tolstoyan movement survived and was reborn. So to choose just one example out of many in the US, the Tolstoy, the Tolstoy farm commune established in Davenport, Washington helped launch the back to the land movement of the 60s and 70s. And I'll show you just one more slide for fun. This is the um, uh, course catalog of the 1970, 1970s Tolstoy College in New York, Buffalo, New York. So to conclude, each of the anarchist literary cultures that I described, the memoirists, the mystics, the communards, wish to retain a relationship to revolution. The memoirs romanticized it. The mystics historicized it as part of their syncretic tradition. And the communards put it into practice as they knew best by cultivating the land. In each movement's literary corpus, the tension between the individual and society is recast in anarchist terms between different forms of stichinist or spontaneity rather than against or in opposition to government and party. Each of the anarchist literary cultures I described, uh, I described sought to put its theory of social transformation into practice through the mechanism of inspiration, whether realist or spiritual sort of mystical, uh, or environmentalist, their text sought to accomplish both the inner and interpersonal work of transformation. As a bridge between text and society, collective authorship practices persisted among the anarchists throughout the 1920s and 30s, no matter what was happening to them. And then long after the demise of these post-revolutionary anarchist cultures, it persisted in the work of anarchist readers, who as a result of their encounters with the uh, anarchist texts were moved to political action. So I've tried to show that what appears in historiography as uh, disparate bursts of anarchist activity followed by uh, demise is in fact a sustained and multi-directional movement um, networked across broad swaths, swaths of time and space. Perhaps there is some grounds then for the anarchist assertion that their movement succeeded while the governments of various governments of various forms collapsed. In any case, it deserves a review of our traditional periodization of radical movements and a closer look at anarchist aesthetics developed in literature to inspire political action in community and society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anya, for a very rich and indeed inspiring talk. I think many of us are always thinking about uh, how to organize society at this moment. So it's right on time. Um, I'm going to open to Q&A, which um, attendees are welcome to put in the chat that they have a question. Um, but first, I'll start off with three of my own. Um, so the first one, speaking of sort of timely talks, um, I usually shy away from topical questions, but I am compelled to ask, uh, given current events in Russia and your work in contemporary drama, if we can sort of identify an afterlife of these movements collectively in Russian drama and perhaps poetry, other literary forms, if maybe there is a sort of discursive cultural resurfacing or reincarnation even of this particular type of revolutionary romantic hero. Uh, I think bravery is a very big buzzword right now. So I immediately thought of that. Uh, my next question is about form and if there was something particularly attractive about the memoir versus other literary forms in the historical context of both late 19th century literature, since Tolstoy is a huge figure, and revolution. So sort of why the memoir? And what might this tell us about Tolstoy's diaries and how we have been reading them, but maybe how we should? 
going forward. Uh, and lastly, um, are there any traces that we can make between anarchist memoir writing and sort of broader Soviet nonfiction writing projects that came about um, in the literary, literary uh, literacy campaigns of the 1920s and 30s? So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Those are such rich questions to think about. Um, so uh, there's a lot to say about contemporary dramas intersections with this uh, anarchist theme. I almost don't know where to start. I'll say one thing that um, I like to spring on people to surprise them if they're in the you know Slavic studies and they're sort of thinking about contemporary Russian drama is that uh, uh, I think the documentary form in many ways, the documentary or sort of verbatim drama was influenced um, by uh, Yelena Grimina's um, avowed anarchist um, position. It's not something that she uh, voiced um, all too publicly ever. It's something that uh, she's said in sort of more private occasions and um, that really comes out in her vocabulary for talking about what she values about the community of Teatro Dok, the sort of political, the hub of political theater in Moscow. And the way she talks about it is, you know, it's these um, sort of clues. Um, she's talking about horizontalism. She's talking about this long view of history where, you know, we, she says, you know, this tradition has never lost. Right, governments crumble. Actually, this really I should have dedicated that you know a separate slide to her because this comes in in a way from something she said. Um, you know, she she her work seeks to also represent this. She says governments crumble, um, but uh, communitarian uh, sort of oppositional um, genealogy is woven like this. You know, for centuries. Um, and so in her work, she's interested in talking about sectarian. Um, uh, movements and she connects them to uh, revolutionary movements and she connects them to present day resistance. Um, so that's just one single example. I think you can also find a lot of example in examples in performance um, in performance art where you know people like um, Nadezhda Talakonikova and uh, other members of uh, Pussy Riot. Um, back when they were operating as a sort of anarchist commune, they were trying to make decisions collectively together as a sort of commune of anarcho-feminists. They were really um, drawing on, you know, anarchist philosophy that they had read, right? So some of their maybe less famous um, and more difficult to listen to songs are called things like Krapotkin Vodka and stuff like that. And I think that's just bubbles up to the surface of a much longer sort of tradition of um, punk citation of classical uh, and more recent um, anarchism. And uh, it's not a mistake, right? In some ways it's um, only in some certain ways is it imported from the West. There's also a lot of sort of uh, precedents to mine in the Russian, you know, in the Russian context. Um, and the, so that's to your first question. And of course, for them, the romantic hero of the, the sort of revolutionary hero who manages, you know, these incredible prison escapes, who survives um, suppression, who rallies the prisoners, criminals, and political prisoners of all parties, you know, to stand up to the bosses. And the, this is a kind of motif in all of these revolutionary memoirs. I mean, that's huge. And that's still very much alive. And it's still, I would say, you know, people draw on it, people cite it. Um, um, people, there's a very interesting press to follow if you sort of want to know what's going on in anarchism. One of the presses that uh, kind of tells you where public taste is going is uh, uh, Commonplace. So they recently released a new edition of Vera Figner's memoir, you know, and they do a lot of this work with historical texts to re-release them and what they think that people will need. Um, and I think that's, again, very intentional and tells us something about where culture is going to go. Uh, so to the second question about the memoir form, I don't know if the memoir form is something that particularly attracts anarchists or particularly attracted me. That's why there's so much memoir in this, you know, in this talk. Uh, anarchists definitely wrote a lot of poetry also. 
Uh, but the memoirs are incredibly compelling. And it's also exciting to see how somebody like Vera, who really, uh, Vera Figner, who really predates the anarchist movement, you know, so she read her share, fair share of Bakunin and Kropotkin. She knew Kropotkin and they were sort of in touch, um, you know, um, uh, periodically throughout her revolutionist career. But she can't be called an anarchist because the anarchist movement didn't exist in the 1880s in Russia. Um, so, but it's interesting to see how all of these things intertwine in part because the memoirs, the sort of mem memoir corp corpuses of different revolutionary uh, um, communities in different prisons actually start to talk about these same sort of elements of collective resistance to all authority and they're rereading Krapotkin and they're thinking about Bakunin. So it's very interesting to see that element of sort of all of these different revolutionary traditions coming together. Um, and uh, for your last question about the literacy campaigns of the 20s and 30s, you know, I don't, I don't know too much about how that intersects. I will say that, um, well, certainly there was a, there was an effort to democratize literature, uh, such that you know, the Vera Figner and these other, you know, revolutionaries from the sort of you know, intelligentsia, I guess you could say, we're really going after, uh, you know, new voices. So working, working class voices, right? Trying to include people, um, trying to include sort of, um, um, you know, writers from the provinces and so on. And in that sense, the broader conversation around the memoirs really was about kind of, yeah, including the whole, giving the whole picture of the revolutionary movement. And it does mean that some of this writing is is very like kind of you know awkward and definitely like I find grammatical mistakes and stuff, but it's very interesting. It's very fresh, you know, to me. Thank you so much for these really great questions. Thank you. I have more, but I think I have to <laughs> move on. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Marietta. Okay. And uh, Marietta, I don't know if you want to say your question. I'm happy to just to read it or respond while reading it. Oops, did I just answer that? Sorry. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, my question, how broad a definition of anarchism should we use so that it's useful? Do we need to specify moments in time? Neo-anarchism, neo-neo-anarchism, 19th century anarchism, thaw era anarchism. Would some of the figures you pull into the story recognize themselves as anarchists? Does it matter if not? What do we gain or lose through the organizing work of this term anarchism? Yeah, thank you for this question. It's very sort of necessary to um, to answer it each time you know we start talking about anarchism. So like Vera Figner is a perfect example. Uh, um, um, you know, the People's Will Party had a very uh, sort of um, uh, very conservative, I would say, program of parliamentary, you know, democracy, democratism or something like that, from what I remember, you know, their platform, political platform was really uninspired. Um, and, uh, you know, so in that sense, you can't, you know, even in that sense, you can't call these people who were, uh, you know, reading and studying, intensely studying Bakunin and Karpotkin's work, you can't call them anarchists. They didn't, simply did not have that sort of picture of um, stateless society in their minds. Um, these later movements that emerge around, you know, 1902, 1905, they really are calling themselves anarchists. Um, and they want to be seen that way. Uh, but they also are very different from what uh, the, from contemporary anarchists, for example. So today, people who call themselves anarchists mostly don't preoccupy themselves with throwing bombs or uh, with what is called economic terror, which is uh, expropriation of sort of wealth, um, wealthy people taking rich people's property and, uh, you know, making communal, squatting it, basically making communal use of it. Um, and nowadays, you really don't see that kind of anarchist practice. Um, but you do see certain elements of sort of direct action um, that, uh, or propaganda by deed, but the deed is no longer, you know, political assassination and economic terror. Um, so I think in the, in the sort of, in the, wh where I like to take my definition of anarchism is from the contemporary readers and reception 
of these um, historic figures. So, and, and they and contemporary people pretty much have a problem with everybody, right? Nobody got it right. And the anarchists themselves don't think that they have, you know, the perfect theory and know what to do next. And they don't have a blueprint, right? And so any person that they draw on, um, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, um, um, or, you know, Krapotkin, you know, they will say there is something that we need to borrow from this and something we need to discard. So I don't know if that gives you, you know, if that's really a, a good answer to your question, but I would say my definition, maybe I borrow it from the people who consider themselves sort of heirs or inheritors to a tradition that they pick and choose from. And yeah, my, my problem has rather been like trying to narrow down the focus um, and not have all the, you know, sort of anarchist clown car of a project. <laughs> um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, I, there is no shortage of really interesting figures and movements to consider. Um, thank you for that question. And uh, I have uh, more, is the memoir the paradigmatic genre for anarchist literature, even more so than lyric poetry, science fiction, et cetera. Uh, I wish it was because then I would know what is happening in the history. Sometimes it's very hard to tell, but no, I think it has to be, you know, I think it has to be the political essay or um, um, lyric poetry and some of it is quite bad. So the memoirs are more very often um, uh, 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 just much more compelling to, to read. Mm. Uh, Question, oh, thank you, Katerina Clark, for your question about uh, Pilniak's uh, novel, Goli God. Actually, I'm working with it right now, and I, I have not formulated uh, an interpretation yet, but I'm really excited to include it in this, um, in the kind of broader picture of intersections between literature and history. And to what extent did international anarchist networks extend to the early Soviet Union? Were the anarchist communities you describe able to draw on writing and current struggles of their foreign comrades? The Templars seem to be drawing on foreign traditions, but the other groups seem more rooted in the Russian anarchist tradition. I guess my qu larger question is about the national versus international dynamics of Soviet anarchism. Rasen, thank you for that question. Yeah, this is another um, topic that I'm really excited to explore more, although there isn't much literature to be had there. And I'm, uh, you know, sort of, or, you know, художественная uh, литература to be had there. And I'm sort of really excited to uh, think about mostly about literature. But the, so the anarchists who survived and fled um, became uh, uh, completely enchanted with the Spanish Civil War in the 30s. And that's maybe not where, you know, you, you probably want me to talk more about the early, early Soviet Union. Um, and I, I will say a word or two about that in a moment, but the Spanish Civil War is this sudden and very exciting ray of hope for a Russian anarchist movement that considers itself defeated um, by the mid 1930s with most of their political organizations routed, um, small enclaves surviving in you know, the provinces and a kind of literary network um, mostly functioning underground through smuggling of texts and, um, and money and so on. Um, but the Spanish Civil War is something that Russian anarchists, exile Russian anarchists, get directly involved in fighting in it and writing for, uh, for Spanish anarchist journals. Um, and in terms of the early Soviet Union, so there is their connection with Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. They make um, those connections even before Goldman and Berkman are deported to, uh, to the Soviet Union in 1919. And they actually, you know, so by then everyone already knows, you know, these famous US anarchists are coming um, uh, and they have sort of heard about, you know, things like Haymarket, um, the Haymarket tragedy in Chicago and so on. So they share, they have a, a sense of shared um, common uh, um, history um, with President McKinley's assassination and, and so on. The um, I, I've traced a little bit, just giving you a sense of the sort of financial networks that were supporting, you know, mostly through the support of political prisoners, which I would say is a major part of anarchist work today. So this in this part hasn't changed. Uh, anarchists still spend a lot of their 
energy and time in supporting political prisoners abroad and at home. Um, and since they see, you know, since they're prison abolitionists, they see all anti-prison work. This is a major aspect of sort of anarchist work. Now, all anti-prison work is work toward uh, an anarchist society. Um, the Templar Knights, yeah, they were drawing more on foreign traditions than the Russian, um, than maybe the sort of realist memoirists and the um, and certainly the peasant Tolstoyans. And the peasant Tolstoyans really were these kind of agrarian, you know, Russian um, kind of mujik, uh, um, you know, or mujikovstuish uh, anarchists. The one interesting thing about the Tolstoyans is that foreigners, you know, came and settled to be part of Tolstoyan um, communes. Uh, radicals and all kinds of sectarians came and settled. So they were actually quite more mixed than just kind of, you know, pure, you know, agrarian sort of ethnic Russian peasant uh, or peasantizing. Um, and about the realist, uh, about the realists, very interestingly, um, and this is part of my bigger project to describe how memoirs try to work against a uh, genre that has been very aptly called dynamite literature um, to describe the sort of mass market um, fiction centered on the anarchist themes at, on the anarchist theme at the turn of the um, uh, uh, 19th century. Uh, so late 19, so like late 1890s or so, um, uh, uh, European writers are enamored with this figure of the Russian nihilist, uh, you know, woman or man, seducing, unsuspecting, you know, uh, um, well-to-do Europeans uh, um, who fall in love with this irresistible, you know, cynical, radical person. And, you know, this was cast as a sort of threat in all of these novels. Um, I mean, Henry James wrote some of these, you know, it's not just kind of pulp fiction style, you know, literature, but they, the, these novels sort of portray, they're very conservative novels. They portray uh, the anarchist as a kind of immigrant outsider threat to modernity and industrialization, the person who wants to destroy all social order. Um, and the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, Russian revolutionaries, not anarchists per se, although, you know, I guess certain Bakuninist or Nichayevist, um, maybe um, elements to their philosophy, you, you could definitely see, they actually uh, start to um, capitalize on this. And so you see people like Stepniak Kravchinsky or uh, Boris Savinkov writing their own you know, tales of sort of cynical, cold, murderous, uh, foreigner, you know, Slavs traveling to Europe and seducing, you know, unsuspecting, you know, bourgeois or aristocratic women and, um, and you know, while uh, stalking their, you know, prey who they don't even know if they want to kill for political reasons or personal sort of jealousy, amorous jealousy reasons, you know, so they kind of participate in what you know, to me looks like really uh, a sort of over the top, you know, melodrama of this foreigner, uh, you know, dangerous bomb throwing foreigner. Um, and somebody mentioned um, Os Oscar Wilde's Vera. Yes, uh, absolutely. And also um, not to be forgotten, Joseph um, Conrad, um, a secret agent. Right, so that's the kind of paradigmatic literature. I think the, the, the memoir works in absolute opposition to that. So the memoir seeks to show how many friends were involved, how many communities were involved, how they all supported each other and they all had these lofty principles, this revolutionary ethic, um, you know, principles that sustain them no matter how much the police pressed them, no matter how much, um, you know, how hungry they were in prison, but they, these lofty ideals um, and their commitments and their friendships really sustain them. So uh, I like this opposition between the dynamite literature and the revolutionary memoir. And I think, because I think it really brings to the surface that anarchist communitarian theme, you know, the theme that's so conveniently forgotten by on one side, the Soviet critics and on the other side, the capitalist uh, European critics. So they, they find this strange common enemy 
right, in the anarchist, um, casting him as this, you know, bomb throwing um, cynical cynic, uh, this person who doesn't care, has no connections, doesn't care about anyone, right, this kind of Nietzscheivist uh, person, but in fact, actual uh, anarchists and actual revolutionaries are extraordinarily proud of their friendships and their communities and their kind of collective networks. Thank you so much. That was a fascinating uh, answer. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left, so maybe we can get in one more question. And I just want to gently remind the attendees that if you want to speak, you can click raise hand and we can then allow you to speak. I see a question from Claire. Um, a broad question, can you say anything about race and ethnicity in the story you're telling about Russian anarchism? How do they negotiate ethnic diversity among their ranks? What kind of non-Western philosophical antecedents, if any, are the anarchists uh, you're discussing drawing on? Yeah, they find non-Western philosophical antecedents in places where, you know, it might honestly be offensive to non-Western <laughs> um, uh, anarchists, you know, to, to um, to be compared to, but really the Russian anarchists, uh, and I think even anarchist researchers, they have this mania for collecting. So, you know, they go back into the earliest possible history and to all of the traditions. And they say, you know, the Stoics and Lao Tzu and, you know, uh, the Bhagavad Gita. And in all of these various places, you find anarchism. You know, and then they read these texts and they cite, you know, and they quote and they're like, look, this shows, you know, this is the, pra these are the practices of the ancients, you know, of various world cultures. Um, and in all of them, do we see this like anarchist, uh, anarchist streak, but more kind of practically by the 1920s, there are anarchists 19, really not 1920s, like 1905, 1910, there are anarchists in Japan um, that are very uh, engaged with uh, Russian, Russian anarchists. Um, there are anarchists in Argentina and a certain segment of the Russian Jewish um, anarchist uh, sort of exile, exiles, um, many, some of them go to Argentina. Um, there are uh, obviously a lot of connections with New York, with the Jewish um, uh, Jewish immigrants um, going to New York. Anarchism was, you know, a very Jewish movement, um, um, and these first groups uh, to form were um, were Jewish, and so there and there were other minorities, so sort of Latvians, Georgians, um, depending on whether you'd consider them minorities. Um, pressed by the Russian Empire, they sort of went to anarchism. We have two more questions, one from Katarina Clark, who I'll allow to speak now. Oh, I think she might have decided to type the Okay. Question. Oh, I see that. Uh, from the late 1890s until the early 20s, Kropotkin was a major figure. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is what, um, yeah, this is what I sort of started saying in response to Claire. Um, that's right. There were also, uh, not to be forgotten, anarchists in China and Korea um, and Japan. Um, and uh, by the early 1920s, he was supplanted by Marx, um, um, Professor Clark says. And that's uh, that's very helpful to, to, to think about this kind of Marx replacing, um, replacing uh, um, Kapotkin as a major influence, but Korea actually has its own, um, for, some, for some years, its own autonomous anarchist region. Um, China, Chinese uh, anarchists are a sort of smaller movement and Japanese anarchists are very um, engaged and sort of um, uh, a sort of interesting vanguard. And then I have one more question. 
Um, I wonder if you could speak on whether Russian anarchism intersects with any other movements around technology, religion, visual art, environmental activism, and more. Do Russian anarchists participate in the global crypto anarchist movement, Slavic neo-paganism? I don't know what the global crypto anarchist movement is. I would say most anarchists uh, I have interviewed or you know know um, would deny that any such thing exists, um, and they are you know kind of avowed political anarchists. Um, and uh, yeah, historically they are you know eco environmentalists. One of the little photos that I flashed is a an early eco anarchist. Um, group um, from the from the 90s, so just kind of forming in the late Perestroika, um, Perestroika era, and you know Kropotkin himself as a naturalist, as a um, and as a geographer, uh, is just one of these many uh, kind of radical figures. He was an, an early environmentalist concerned about um, about drought, about sort of climate change. Um, and in terms of visual art, I only mentioned very briefly uh, uh, the House of Anarchy, where the anarcho-futurists, which you know included um, Alexander Rochenko, Malievich, but also Mayakovsky, wrote for the Anarchia newspaper. Um, so some of that you can find information on that in uh, Nino Guryanova's wonderful book called *The Aesthetics of Anarchy*. Um, but there are many other visual more contemporary visual arts movements that, uh, you know, where the founders or sort of uh, profess uh, anarchist politics. Um, and I only briefly mentioned um, Pussy Riot, I guess, as a kind of performance art group, but you can think about Vaina and other actionist movements. Um, and um, there is the previous speaker in the series, actually, Daniel um, uh, Leiderman wrote a fabulous dissertation about um, anarchism and uh, Moscow conceptualism. Um, so that's, you know, takes us back to the right 70s and 80s um, and this intersection of anarchist ideas with Moscow conceptualism is very interesting. Um, but Slavic neo-paganism, yeah, it's a great, you know, it's a great question about whether some of these uh, anarchist influences have gone conservative and sort of ended up, you know, somehow strangely merging with nationalist impulses, um, which are anathema to, you know, anarchists who don't believe in government and believe in sort of borderless, um, self-governed com com um, communities. Um, they're, you know, proud of their kind of tradition of tolerance and et cetera. Um, yeah, some, and I found these online actually disturb quite disturbingly some um, inheritors of the peasant Tolstoyan tradition are in fact people who, you know, be believe in the Teoria Zagavara, so they believe in a kind of like, you know, anti-Semitic, you know, conspiracy theory, they, um, um, they cultivate the land and they sort of buy up land, but they also possibly engage in pyramid schemes with this kind of pseudo, you know, um, cult of like organic food and um, you know, natural child rearing and childbirth and things like that. And it's very, it's so similar to what you see uh, in the US um, too, where a desire for kind of a healthier, more um, ethical lifestyle uh, somehow ends up, you know, horseshoeing into basically white supremacy. And so in that sense, very similar to, you know, very similar, lots of similarities between contemporary US and Russia, but very little similarity to actual anarchists. So you won't find a political anarchist movement that espouses that kind of ideology. It just doesn't exist. Um, anarchists are still, you know, they still consider themselves leftists um, and radical um, leftists at that. All right, um, since we can't see the audience, I hope they allow me to thank you for a wonderful talk on their behalf and to say that we very much look forward to your upcoming work, especially this book. And thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you very much.